involved and I didn't want to take all the time when it's supposed to be about you and not me. So um, there's some really good books about this topic. And you can learn about a lot about towers and uh, tower safety on these three websites. Uh, this book is really good, uh, Antenna Towers for Radio Amateurs, uh, produced by uh, K4, or, or authored by K4ZA. Up the Tower uh, by K7LXC is another excellent book and kind of takes a different perspective of the same topic. They're both worth reading. And uh, Safety, uh, there's another excellent book on that topic available from the ARRL. So spend your $5 gift certificate on, uh, on one of these. Um, all of the manufacturer specifications for rotators are marketing hype. They're not, it's not reliable data and you can't really use it. So as is often the case with hams, it's more reliable to use our experience with rotators than it necessarily is to look at the specifications that the rotator manufacturers use to have us buy their product instead of the competing product. So I've kind of grouped these rotators based upon experience into kind of categories. Um, and, and, I'm, and I know there are more rotators than just these, but these are popular rotators. So for, for relatively small Yaggies, the kind of the traditional three and four element Yaggy on booms of uh, 24 feet or less, there are three good choices out there for rotators that have been demonstrated to be uh, good, reliable products for handling antennas of this size. And there are their websites right there. So you don't have to write anything down. It's in your book. And similarly for uh, kind of medium size uh, Yaggies for 20 through 10 meters, there's another set of very good products from our manufacturers that serve the ham community. And they're a little more expensive. And they're reliable products for kind of medium size antennas. And a lot of us don't want to stop with medium size antennas. So if we go. If we go to the kind of antennas you find in the more competitive big stations, 36 to 48 foot booms, there's another family of very good products that we can purchase that handle those. But notice this very important caveat. These, these rotators will not work with very large full-size Yaggies for 40 meters. And they will not work for an antenna like the Monster by Stepper. Those big antennas will turn these rotators into a pile of junk quickly. So for the very large antennas, you need very capable rotors. And again, we're very fortunate that there's a family of very capable rotors for big antennas. And here they are. And I'm sure there are some more, too. Uh, for tower accessories, in my, some, my uh, presentation about this topic, I emphasized never, ever purchase accessories for towers or guiding systems from your favorite home uh, hardware supplier. Never do that. You're putting your life at risk. You're putting the integrity of the investment you've made at risk. There are manufacturers out there that serve our ham community that sell the products we should be using. And here they are, right there. And that's in your book. And uh, for the, this is the specification for bolts that are uh, qualified for tower use rather than the homeowner kind of bolts that you find at Home Depot. They're ASTM spec A325, and you can get them from these two manufacturers, from these two suppliers at very reasonable prices. It's not worth saving pennies to buy the very inexpensive bolts. Yep, McMaster is really great. A comment from the audience, uh, McMaster Car is a fabulous supplier of industrial components. Many of them are very useful for ham use in our tower systems. Their catalog is fantastic. Their delivery is unbelievable. If I order a component from them before 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a weekday, I'll have it on my doorstep in less than 12 hours. It's unbelievable. And that's not sometimes, that's always. Um, U-bolts, again, a couple of uh, very good suppliers of uh, hot dip galvanized U-bolts, which is what I prefer, and also stainless U-bolts. I prefer to avoid these because of the issue with galling, so I tend to go this way. But stainless steel is perfectly good, 
but you've got to be sure you put anti-galling compound on those threads so that you want, don't wind up welding the nut to the threads. And that's a particularly annoying if it happens to you up on a tower. The only way to undo that is to break the bolt, and then you have to replace it. And uh, stainless steel bolts and hose clamps, again, McMaster Car is a fabulous source. Aluminum tubing, we've got uh, ham suppliers of uh, excellent products, all shippable, and there's some industrial suppliers here too. Um, all very good sources. And for pre-cut aluminum plate to size, uh, all of these manufacturers will cut aluminum plate to you to the size you want. Of course, there's a cutting fee, but it's very reasonable. And uh, phenolic and fiberglass plate and rod. A McMaster car supplies that. It's great for insulators, for verticals, or the uh, center of a driven element on a Yagi. So that's the end of my uh, spiel, and it's over to you folks, right in the front. Yeah. So the question is, what's a good source for antenna masts? Uh, in particular, the very high strength masts, the chrome molly. Well, you know, I used to have a really good answer to that, at least in the part of the country where I live. Um, there used to be a supplier um, in Pennsylvania, but they've shut down. So uh, I have found a supplier in Baltimore an industrial supplier, I don't remember the name, but, but I think about the only thing you can do to find those kind of materials is to uh, search through the industrial listings in your local area, in a big city in your local area, and hopefully one of those, they will generally be called specialty metal, metals suppliers, and hopefully one of them will have it. It took kind of an exhaustive search to talked to a lot of steel suppliers in the Baltimore area, but we did find in the Baltimore area a, a supplier of chrome molly steel. And of course, the shipping price is inherent. We can go pick it up. We don't have to ship it. So I, yeah, well, I don't, I'm sorry. I don't have a good answer to your question. It's going to take some research. One thing you might do is on the Tower Talk Reflector, ask if someone else has found something in your, in New England. So I don't know the answer. Yes, right here in the middle of the room. So, so this was really a comment rather than a question. And as I mentioned, some of us in the room are going to have better answers than what I can come up with. So uh, yeah, if you find some metal fabricators in your area or uh, people that do maybe more challenging tower work in the area, they might have an answer to your question. Any other questions? Over here. So let me repeat the question. Uh, as I mentioned in a presentation this morning, uh, one of the really excellent mast systems, military surplus, used by many hams is the AB577 military portable mast. 
It was uh, used in the Korean War and for some period of time after that, and many hams have it. As an aside, the W3AO Field Day site, a couple of miles from my house, uses 12 of those. And yes, we acquired those for about $300 a piece 10 years ago. So it's not unreasonable to acquire a dozen of them with a group that has 100 members. But those, the AB577 mast is difficult to acquire today and they typically sell for over three, over $1,000 when you find them. I know of at least two that have sold in the last month, so uh, they are available, but they're not $300 anymore. They're 1000 but they're worth every penny of that $1,000, in my opinion, and you can resell them for $1,000, and people will knock on your door with cash in hand uh, trying to get that AB577 from you for $1,000 if you don't want it. Uh, unfortunately, I have to say the answer to your real question and your real question is, do you know of a replacement out there that's uh, for the AB 577 in the ham community? And my unfortunate answer is no. And I don't know if anyone else knows of one. So it's no, I'm afraid. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is a variety of subjects having to do with mounting a rotator on a tower. Uh, I think we all know that by far the preferred approach is to mount the, the rotator inside the tower and what about how high, where should it be? And the other question is, well, if the tower manufacturer didn't provide a mechanism to place a mast inside the tower, can I put the mast, put the rotator on top of the tower? So um, the first question about where should the rotator be uh, located relative to the top of the tower if I'm going to rotate, ro mount it inside the, the tower. The most important aspect of that question, well, uh, before I get to that point, one other point. That also depends on how many antennas you're going to stack above the top of the tower. If you're only going to place one antenna just above the top of the tower on the mast, you can really put that rotator almost anywhere. But it gets more complicated if you're, going to, if you're going to extend that mast well above the top of the tower and intend to install multiple antennas, especially if one of those antennas well above the top of the tower is large. It's a big difference whether you've got a two element 40 meter Yagi 10 feet above the tower or a two meter 11 element Yagi up there. It makes a big difference. Uh, so what is my recommendation? My recommendation is that if you intend to place any antennas of any significant size well above the top of the tower, that it's much, much easier to perform maintenance on the tower if the length of the mast is such that you can place the rotator at least as far down into the tower as the top antenna is above the tower, if the antenna is large. It's just a whole lot easier to deal with. If, if the bottom of the mast only extends two or three feet below the top of the tower, and then the mast goes up 10 or 11 or 12 feet above the tower, if you have to remove the rotator, you have to go through a lot of extra labor to be sure that the, that little stub, which has a tremendous amount of uh, foot pounds of force on it when you remove its support, to make sure that it doesn't flip sideways. So my recommendation is it's a lot easier for the tower installer or especially the maintenance guy when, something, when the rotator fails and needs to be replaced if you extend the mast down into the tower. It's, a whole, it's easier and safer. So the other, the, and especially safer. And safety on a tower is a big deal. It's not, not to be uh, taken lightly. And the other question is, okay, what about if my tower manufacturer didn't provide for mounting a rotator inside the tower. I think the preference is talk to somebody who is mechanically inclined. Somebody, probably you know a ham that... Uh
And chances are very good that a, that a mechanism can be fabricated to allow a rotator to be mounted inside the tower as long as there's enough physical space to place the rotator in the tower. And that's where they always should be. Um, so find, a, a mechanically inclined person will probably find that to be an easy problem to solve. And it'll require some fabrication, but it's not really sophisticated stuff. And there are plenty of metal fabricators almost anywhere. Um, if none of that works, and you have to place the rotator on top of the tower, all of these rotators are showed are severely derated when you have to do that. So you, know, you, have to, you have to get a much more heavy rotator, and you get much less return for your investment by placing the rotator on top of the tower. So it's kind of the last resort. So I wouldn't do it. Find yourself a, a capable, a mechanically inclined person. I think they'll solve the problem for you. Any other questions? Right in front of me. Yeah. So before I repeat the question, what? Tell me more about the antenna you want to put there. So it's a 35-foot boom, or, but it's long, long boom. Okay. So, okay. Um, so the question is. I've got a 10 meter antenna that has a boom of about 32 feet or so. It's fairly lightweight. I'd like to side mount on this on the tower. I've already bought a tick ring rotator. Is that a good choice or maybe should I be considering some other choice such as a sidearm, which is a, a swinging gate is the common name for, a, for that kind of a sidearm where there's a mast that runs along the outside of the tower and uh, there's a short horizontal mass that allows the tower, the, the antenna to rotate about 300 degrees. And uh, I guess what do I think about those two alternatives? I've used both, and they both work really well. So let me see if I can describe the, the, uh, the, the benefits of each and the, and the, the uh, detractions of each. Um, a side, the side mount swinging gate approach is pretty inexpensive. Uh, you can purchase that. Uh, I don't know if W9IIX still sells that, Whiskey 9 India, India X-Ray. But he sold that hardware for a while, and there may be some others. A mechanically inclined person can usually fabricate the parts to build a sidearm swinging gate uh, without a lot of trouble. So you can build something like that for, let's say, a few hundred dollars. So that's the good news. What's the bad news? When you have a Yagi and you place the parasitic elements very close to a tower, something really bad happens. The tower detunes the parasitic element of that antenna. And if you look at a swing arm mount rotating system, for a lot of Yagis, and chances are with a 10 meter Yagi especially, where the elements are pretty close together, there's a good chance that if you use a swing arm mount, that one of those parasitic elements at some point in its rotation is going to come very close to the tower. What do I mean by very close? About one tower width. So if you have a, let's say you have a Roan 45, it's uh, about 18 inches on a face. Any parasitic element on any Yagi that's closer than 18 inches to that Roan 45, I don't care what kind of amount it's on, that parasitic element is detuned. And it's detuned to be shorter. And what happens? In the worst case, it kind of cuts off the performance of all the Yagi ahead of that element. So if you have, let's say, a six element Yagi, and you mount the antenna such that one parasitic element is within one tower face width, you've cut the size of the antenna in half generally not a very good thing. And uh, a uh, swinging arm mount is, can kind of do that, particularly on the higher bands. But it's very economical. So if you can use it in such a way that you don't get any parasitic elements within one tower width of the tower, hey, you save money and it's good. It's a very good solution. I used it for years. I don't happen to use it anymore, but I had great success with it. 
And what about the tick ring? I've had a tick ring in the air for 20 years, turning a full-size three-element Yagi at 100 feet, and I've never had any significant problems with it. I've had a few maintenance, routine maintenance things to do, replacing motors, but for 20 years, that's been a reliable system. And the tick ring is a relatively inexpensive. I mean, it's, it's still $1,500 or so with a couple of motors. Yeah, so I wouldn't, I, I, you've got them, I wouldn't hesitate to use it. But again, think, when you mount that Yagi on that uh, rotator, try to mount it in such a way that the parasitic elements of the antenna are at least one tower width away from the tower. Otherwise, it literally is like cutting off the boom from that point forward. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, right here. Okay, so, so the question is, uh, what's a more inexpensive way to insulate the base of a tower uh, than the parts that you get from Roan that are intended for the broadcast industry? The, for example, for the Roan 25, there's, a, there's an insulator assembly that you can buy from Roan, usually used by broadcast stations, and that thing is about $600 or $800. So it's quite expensive. Uh, no, it's not necessary to purchase that very expensive Roan solution. And uh, I believe um, you can uh, purchase those insulators uh, from um, Array Solutions. And they're not very expensive, certainly far less expensive than from Roan. So take a look at the Array Solutions website or visit their booth at Dayton and ask them that same question, and I think you'll get an answer that you like. Okay, all the way in the back of the room. Okay. So Whiskey Bravo Zero Whiskey is apparently another alternative. But I'll tell you there's definitely good solutions at more, uh, at prices we're more likely to be happy about paying. Yes, question in the middle. Okay, so here's the question. The, 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 the person who asked the question said he's never heard about this tower detuning problem before. So now he's starting to think about uh, tri-banders in particular where there usually isn't, a, isn't very much space on the boom. And unfortunately, I have to tell you that towers do detune parasitic elements in close proximity to the tower. So the bottom line is you're not gonna like the consequence of what happens. When you place any Yagi, whether it's a multi-band Yagi or a mono-band Yagi, and you place any elements within one tower width of the tower, that antenna performance is degraded significantly. And you might not like the result. Yes, yeah, that's correct. A four-element stepper is easy to mount on a Yagi and keep the parasitic elements well away from the tower. That is correct. So that is one solution. But if you mount any Yagi with the parasitic elements within one tower width of the tower, bad things are going to happen. Guaranteed. Okay, so people are asking for more bad news. Uh, and I can serve up bad news on that question too. So the question is, what happens if I mount a vertical close to a tower? Um, oh, what frequency do you have in mind for that question? Well, give me some ideas. Multi means anything. 80 through 10. And how close is close to you? 10 or 12 feet away, so uh, much less than a half wavelength. Okay, so here's the question. I want to put a vertically polarized antenna for the HF bands all the way up through 10 meters and I want to be able to place that vertical within 10, 12 feet of the tower. The tower becomes part of the antenna. The tower becomes part of the antenna. 
Uh, so, so, the, the, so there was another question here. So the first gentleman asked, I want to put a vertically polarized antenna very close to the tower, less than half a wavelength. The tower is part of the antenna, and it's strongly part of the antenna. It affects the directivity of the antenna. Uh, the detailed answer I can't give you because it depends on the height of the tower, and it depends on the band. The spacing's going to change, but you can be sure that the antenna that an HF vertically polarized antenna placed within 10 feet of a tower is going to have a directive pattern. That might be a good thing for you and it might be a bad thing and all the details about how directive and how deep the nulls are all depend on the details. And the only way you can answer that is to model it. Okay, so there's another really good question from the gentleman right behind you. And that is okay, let's take the 12 feet and make it 60 feet. What band did you have in mind? Well, give me more, I can't deal with that. Okay, say 40 meters. So, okay, here's the question. This gentleman probably didn't like the answer that a 10 meter antenna within 12 feet of the tower is, uh, makes the tower part of the antenna. So we're gonna go down in frequency by a factor of four from 28 megahertz to seven megahertz. Well, that, tr that translates 12 feet to 48 feet. So the answer is the same. Uh, an antenna that's located less than a half wavelength away from the tower, and that's 60 feet is less than half a wavelength on 40 meters, the tower is part of the antenna when you do that, and it's going to cause the antenna to be directive. It's not going to be omni anymore. So if you wanted an omni, you don't have it anymore. And if you're ex willing to accept directivity, it might be good. It might be, it, or you know, maybe it won't be uh, what you have in mind, but the antenna is part of the system, or the tower. It's part of the system. And it's hard to detune the tower. It's not impossible to detune the tower, but it's difficult and beyond the scope of anything I can talk about here. The effect is much, much less. Yes, because at, at, so the question is, okay, he didn't like my answer to the 40 meter question. <laughs> Let's go back to 10 meters again. Is the answer any better on 10 meters? Yeah, the answer is a lot better on 10 meters because uh, a wavelength on 10 meters is 35 feet. So you want to put the antenna 60 feet away from the tower so you're two wavelengths away, more or less. The effects are much, much less. So, okay. So, Tim, what's the story here? I'm out of time. Well, we got lots of questions answered, and this is a good time to quit. Thanks, everybody.